Good day to you. I don't have a lot of time, but I will be happy to share a few things with you if you will bear with me and allow me to pray upon your attention. Just today, I, I received a note from my precious Agnes. As she had come down from Richmond to stay with Mrs. Meade here in Petersburg and hope to see her weary old papa. I would suggest to you that it's the army that my young Agnes would prefer to see rather than her weary old papa. <laughs> Nonetheless, I unfortunately must sit down at my earliest convenience and pen a note to Agnes and advise her that I will be unable to meet with her at this time, for I must go out on the lines again in the morning and should be there possibly the whole entire day. When I sit down to pen that note, I must have Colonel Taylor remind me that I also need to pen a note to my dear Mary and daughter and Mildred back in Richmond. I did have a, a pleasant evening yesterday when I came into my headquarters after being on the lines all day, I discovered that Fitzhugh and Rob were there waiting for me in my camp. And we had the pleasure to dine together last evening before they had to return to their commands. It was good to see that they are well under the circumstances and we had a pleasant evening. I must share with you that uh, I have been meeting with Secretary Breckinridge on a regular basis uh, several times a week over the past few weeks, uh, keeping a close eye on our current military situation. Secretary Breckinridge has agreed with me that we must find some way to dissuade this General Grant from continuing to extend our lines to the West. I am afraid that we may lose our contact with the Weldon Railroad, and if so, we must revert to other strategies. I've encouraged General Breckinridge to do all with uh, Secretary Breckinridge Forgive me, I digress there a moment. Secretary Breckinridge to do all within his power to stop the desertion that's taking place. And I've also issued General Order Number 8, which is to be read at formation every day. I met with uh, General Gordon on the 23rd of March to, to discuss the possibility of attacking Fort Stedman. We considered that if we can break General Grant's line and get behind him, it will force him to consolidate and stop his stretching our lines to the west. General Gordon agreed with me and on the morning of the 25th of March, the indefatigable General Gordon executed his attack precisely at 4 a.m. He gained immediate success, much to my pleasure. But by 7 a.m., he was in a dreadful, dreadful crossfire and enfilading artillery fire so much so that I had to give the order that he must withdraw. It was during the withdrawal that we suffered our greatest loss in that fight. I feared that this was our last chance to maneuver General Grant out of his intent on extending us. 
I had to issue just today an order to General Gordon that was most disconcerting for me, that he must hold his position at all hazards. And it troubled me because his lovely wife, Fanny, just yesterday gave birth to their third son. But I know General Gordon well, and he will do his duty. That I can depend on. It is difficult to keep track of the communications from all parts of our country. I learned just this morning that uh, from General Richard Taylor, he reports a large federal column moving towards Selma, just 70 miles away. I received word from General Kirby Smith his army is stranded on the west banks of the Mississippi and cannot cross. He asks me what to do, suggests that perhaps going into Missouri would be a benefit. I can see that it could serve no practical purpose. My intelligence tells me there are large forces gathering at Stanton and Winchester with orders to join General Grant. I received communication today from General Johnston. General Schofield's army has now joined General Sherman in front of him. And he says that he can do little but harass them. Stoneman's cavalry is moving upon the lead mines at Grayson by way of the New River. I cautioned His Excellency the President that it may become necessary for us to abandon our lines before Richmond and Petersburg. And it weighs heavily on my heart to know the privations that surely must attend the people if I am indeed forced to, with, to withdraw from the lines before Petersburg and Richmond. Yesterday, Fitzhugh Lee's cavalry and General Pickett's division were sent to our right to check a movement by those people. And my last report last night, they had driven them beyond Five Forks and established their lines at Five Forks, but today, all through the day, we have heard heavy firing from the area near Five Forks. I'm very anxious to know the outcome, for if we lose Five Forks, surely we'll lose our depot at Stony Point, and that will be our last connection with the Weldon Railroad our only source of forage for the animals at present. I have sent word to General Hill that I should like to meet with him at 4 a.m. in the morning. I've likewise sent a courier to General Longstreet, directing him to bring a portion of his command up to reinforce our position at Five Forks should it be necessary. I hope in the morning that when General Hill and General Longstreet and I can meet, that we will be able to feel some relief from the current situation. And Sergeant Tucker, General Hill's chief courier, arrived uh, just after dinner this evening informing me that uh, General Hill will not be sleeping in his headquarters tonight, but instead crossed the road with his lovely wife, Dolly, and their children. I could not bring myself to send word back to dissuade him from such an act. If it were within my power, I should be with my very, very children and wife myself. So I shall allow him to rest this evening in the comfort of his family 
and in the morning, perhaps, when he and General Longstreet and I get together, we'll have an opportunity to discuss the situation. I mentioned that I have been meeting with Secretary Breckinridge and the President, and I told Mr. Davis, quite frankly, that it may become necessary for us to abandon Richmond and Petersburg and try to steal a march on General Grant and perhaps turn south if we can catch the South Side Railroad and join up with General Johnston there. Perhaps then we can put our forces together and fight General Sherman before Grant can come up and then we can turn our forces on Grant. The President and the Secretary seem to agree with me that this might be an appropriate strategy, but they still hold hard to the belief that we must defend Richmond at all hazards. I would share more information with you, but uh, my experience has been that when I share too much information with the people, it seems to find its way to the newspapers. And we have not yet been able to convince the newspaper editors that the people at the North read quite as well as we do. <laughs> I do wish I could get word from Five Forks it would allow me to rest much easier this evening. I must attend to those notes in a few moments, but I could attend to a few questions if there are some among you. Yes, ma'am. What is General Pickett during this time, and how are your feelings toward each other at this point in time? Uh, General Pickett is, is a, a most uh, competent and capable officer. Uh, he is to our right, as I mentioned, at Five Forks. He's there with Fitzhugh Lee's cavalry. I'm very anxious to hear word from them of the outcome. We've heard firing from that direction all day. But I, at, at this moment, have not heard word. Yes, sir. General Lee, are you concerned about the desertions from your army? Absolutely, sir. I expressed earlier that I have spoken to Secretary Breckinridge and asked him to do all that's within his power uh, to dissuade the practice of desertion. And I have also issued General Order Number 8, which is to be read at formation every day. Yes, ma'am. It basically uh, suggests to the troops that uh, desertion could result in some rather unhappy conditions for them. But at the same time encourages them to remember our cause and their loved ones back home and why we are in the struggle. In the blue shirt, sir. Yes, uh, General, in discussions with... Uh, That's not union issue, is it? <laughs> no. President Davis uh, is as concerned about uh, the exchange process as I am. This General Grant is different from those we have encountered in the past. Uh, at every point that we have defeated General Grant, beginning with the opening guns at, near Chancellorsville this spring, Every general before him has turned tail after properly whipped and gone for Washington City. This General Grant is different. I fear he's somewhat like a small dog at the heel. 
very tenacious. He, President Davis, has approached the authorities and sent communication to this General Grant concerning exchange. Um, to my last conversation with the President, uh, he has had no response from General C Grant on the subject. There was a gentleman in the back. Appomattox? Yeah. <laughs> I've got a crystal ball here. <laughs> got a what? Hasn't happened yet. You are not a newspaper editor in disguise, are you, sir? No, I am not. Very well. Uh, the gentleman's question is what makes me continue to fight in the face of such circumstances. Sir, I am a soldier, and it is my job to do my duty. And as long as my country directs me to continue to do my duty, I shall do it, sir. What would you be speaking of, sir? Well, is he telling you to fight or else? He's not telling me to fight or else, sir. He does not need to do so. Well, that's, that's my the Army has not been defeated, sir. Uh, and I will continue to fight until there is no other course of action. Yes, sir. Uh, General Nathan, Nathan Bedford yeah, Forrest. Bedford Forrest. I've heard wonderful things about Mr. Forrest, but... Uh, I know he's not a West Pointer, but have you ever considered that? I have not considered it. I have had uh, very good cavalry support for my Army. And uh, trust me when I tell you that uh, were it not for General Forrest, uh, I fear things would have been much worse for the Army of Tennessee. And you probably would wonder what my thoughts were about General Bragg. <laughs> and uh, I would share with you, sir, that my mother raised me to believe that if I cannot speak well of someone, <laughs> I should hold my tongue. So in this case, I shall hold my tongue. <laughs> yes, ma'am. The lady would like to know how I think things may be different if General Jackson or General Stewart were still around. I fear she, you, may not appreciate my answer. I've been asked on several occasions by numerous people to uh, judge past actions and deeds and to indulge in what-if situations. And I've given it careful consideration, and I find that my faith in my God Almighty will not allow me to do so. For you see, I believe that for me to judge past actions and deeds of others, and indeed myself, is to deprive my Creator, my God, of what I believe to be a divine right. He alone shall judge past deeds and actions, and He alone holds the key to our future. And it is but for me as a good Christian to continue to trust in Him and the promise He makes us through His Son, Jesus Christ. 
Let me go to this side of the room. Come right back. Yes. Yes, ma'am. And at this point, what, what is the feel about the possibility of the junior becoming, of surrendering the agreement to the mule? Is it a possibility that you have to go further south? It shall distress me so, ma'am, to give up my home country, if that should become necessary. If it were not for my native land, Virginia, I should not have drawn my sword again. As I told Sir Mr. Francis Preston Blair in 1861, that although I was opposed to secession and deprecating war, I could take no part in any invasion of southern states, except for the defense of my native state, Virginia, I never again intended to draw my sword. But I can assure you, ma'am, that if it become necessary, I shall give my life on my sword for my home, Virginia. Yes, sir. General, please forgive me for not saying you when I address you. Uh, I wonder if You're you forgiven. <laughs> I wonder if you would comment about the Army of Tennessee, whether it was a failure of leadership or logistics I cannot speak to the Army of Tennessee. My experience of the Army is limited at best, and primarily then only through rumors and reports. And I've seen very few of the actual official reports. It would be wrong for me to judge what has taken place there. I expressed my feelings about General Bragg. And I suggested to His Excellency the President that I did not believe John Bell Hood, although a brilliant division commander, was up to the task of Army Command. President Davis believed differently, and as my leader and my president, I will obey his word. But it would be wrong for me to judge what has taken place with the Army of Tennessee. Uh, I can't speak to that. <coughs> yes, sir. General, um, I thought I detected maybe some concern over the current guidance for you to uh, take in the defense of Richmond. If you were given a little more leeway to maneuver your troops as you saw maybe most tactically fit, would you push them in another direction towards another key point? The gentleman's question is, do I feel harnessed, perhaps, yes, that's in my actions? No, sir, I do not. My relationship with His Excellency the President has, has been very good. Uh, I have been content with what we have been able to accomplish since we have been locked in the siege. I, it concerned me after Cold Harbor uh, for several days uh, we could not find contact with General Grant's army, but I presumed, as time proved he did, that he again had tried to move by our right and cross the James River. I wrote Mary from North Anna before Cold Harbor that I believed that this was in fact the intention of General Grant and his army to draw us up in a siege before Richmond and Petersburg and use their superior weight and numbers to wear us down. But having said that, I must tell you, sir, this Army of Northern Virginia, this men like these have not trod this earth before them. I can't say honestly that I shall write the history, but I believe some will write the history of this army, and it will go down in history as the greatest army to have trod this, his, this earth. <coughs> to date, this army has not been driven from the field as a result of battle. 
and when given the opportunity to maneuver and fight on ground of its choosing, I have every bit of trust and faith in every one of the men in this army. Yes, sir. General, um, you mentioned earlier that um, you would obey whatever orders were given to you because you were a soldier. Do you believe, um, first, two questions. One, the troops that were fighting for you, did they fight out of conviction for the purpose of the, the whole, for the reasons the South was fighting? Do they actually all understand it, A, and B, do they fight for that out of conviction? And B, and C, do you, <laughs> sorry, do you, your own convictions, are they purely for Virginia, or do you believe anything at all about what the South is trying to do? Okay. <clears throat> Did someone check his papers before he came in? Uh, sir, I think you will find that the men in the Army of Northern Virginia truly fight for their homes and their families, and they fight for each other. I could be wrong, but I believe that soldiers who fight, regardless of their lofty principles and causes at the outset of a conflict, once pressed with the reality of combat, they fight for each other. As for the lofty principles of cause, the people of the South have never wished for or wanted anything more than to be allowed to live the free life they believed guaranteed under the Constitution and to live it the way they see fit. It was not the people of our land that sought to dissuade the people at the North to live a different way. It was them that came to our land and they raised arms on our soil. As for my conviction, sir, as I expressed, I was opposed to secession and deprecating war, and still am. I saw the horrors of war in Mexico with General Scott and many of the men that are fighting on both sides in this struggle. I knew what war was. The politicians didn't know. And to this very day, I dare say, sir, that they do not understand it yet. As I wrote Mary from the Brazos River in Texas before I could return to Virginia, that I had prayed fervently that our Creator would give wisdom to our politicians and allow cooler heads to prevail, to find solutions that did not ask for bloodshed and war. But the politicians did not have cooler heads, and the cooler heads did not prevail. But for as long as a man stands with a gun on my soil, I will defend the cause. Yes, sir. General, do you feel that if England and or France were involved at this time with the Confederate Treaty of Paris independence, and you would cease in part by the decide to go to the hmm. uh, If I may take the second half of the question first. Uh, my reasons for going into Pennsylvania, there has been much talk, and unfortunately, if you listen to gossip, and I fear most people do, uh, it's not accurate. My reasons for going across the Potomac in the summer of 63 had nothing to do with England, had nothing to do with France. It had nothing to do with Washington City. It had to do purely with the fact that I needed to draw the Army of the Potomac out of Virginia. 
from my native soil. The South is starving, sir. The people of my beloved Commonwealth are starving, as much as my army. The people in the valley need peace to plant their fields and raise their crops and harvest them so that there will be feed and food not only for my army but for the people. So whatever rumors you've heard, sir, I dissuade you. Your first part of your question, France and England. Those brave patriots, one of them having been my father, Light Horse Harry Lee, who fought for independence from the mother country in England a mere 50-some years ago. They did not beg for assistance from any foreign power. They did not see the need to rely on anyone but those people who they believed to be true patriots, who believed in the freedom that could belong to a people in a way that to our historical record has not existed before. And as I suggested to President Davis and many in the Confederate Congress, it would be foolish to rest their hopes on a foreign power to intervene on our behalf. And what then? Does that make us beholden to them? And what cost for that? Yes, sir. I have heard many rumors about our beloved Arlington House and my dear Mary. May God bless her strength and soul. She laments little and lacks comment on the subject, but I fear we shall not see our beloved Arlington House again. I have often thought about that wonderful place in a more peaceful time. It's beauty. It's warmth in the sun. And to gaze across the Potomac at the beloved capital of our country before we became a divided nation. But I cannot allow my thoughts to wander there for long for my responsibilities and weights are strong. Yes, sir. General Hood, with all respect to you, uh, no one that asked supply trains were in Appomattox. Why didn't you send some more protection for our trains here in Appomattox knowing how important supplies are to maintain the army? Appomattox. I'm aware of the Appomattox River. Oh, and I know the railroad passes through Appomattox. In the orange shirt. Uh, in 1862, I held a meeting with President Davis, and I suggested to him then that I believed that it would be to our advantage to offer emancipation to any slave that would serve our cause and our country. President Davis was uncertain of it, uh, on principle, 
fairly assured that the Confederate Congress and would probably not support the idea. But when I suggested that the emancipation of the slave alone was not enough, that I believed that the emancipation not only of the slave himself, but of anyone who he called his family should equally be emancipated. You cannot ask a man to fight for freedom for himself when he cannot have that same freedom for his family. President Davis assured me that he would take the issue up in conversations, but he did not feel the time was right to approach the Congress. Now, I have been told by General Longstreet that uh, before his untimely death, General Patrick Claiborne had equally advanced the proposition, possibly more vocally and bravely than I, and even circulated a petition that he hoped to present to His Excellency the President on the subject of emancipation for service. It was just in February that President Davis finally uh, gave permission for the enlistment of black troops for their emancipation. But even then, as I cautioned the President, it did not allow the emancipation of their immediate family. And I cautioned President Davis then that I believed that was a wrong-headed decision, that I believe it could come to no good end for no man can be asked to fight and shed his blood without the belief that his family can enjoy the fruits of his effort. Yes, sir. Um, going back to Gettysburg, you all said, um, uh, I'm sorry to say, um, it's been rumored that you were under the weather, which maybe affected your decision to, to put your hand across the street against the guard. Your question is, was my health satisfactory for service? Yes. Well, sir, I can tell you during our northern campaign of 1863, that my itinerary was such that if my health was of question, I hardly see how I could have met the itinerary that I kept. I rarely went to bed before midnight or after, arose before four o'clock every morning during the entire campaign. There's been rumors again, and unfortunately, I think most people listen to the rumors. Perhaps it makes better news, <laughs> Mr. Editor. <laughs> yes, sir. General, what are your thoughts on uh, General Grant, and what are your reminiscences of your, uh, do you remember meeting him down in the Mexican War? Indeed, sir. I, I know we met on that occasion. I, I was serving then on General Winfield Scott's staff as, as a young captain of engineers. He had sent me on an errand to General Garland's headquarters. And upon entering the general bivouac area, I, the first young officer I encountered was a, a young lieutenant who announced himself to be U.S. Grant. And I have to believe it is the same Grant that is before me here in Petersburg. When the occasion is allowed, I've given some consideration and thought to our meeting and tried to recollect how he looked, but I've never been able to recall a single feature. <laughs> I do recall, however, that uh, he possibly does not think well of me, for his appearance was much disheveled, <laughs> and I addressed him for it and suggested that he was not a good representation of an officer of the United States Army. 
that perhaps is why he is so tenacious today. <laughs> He's not forgiven me yet. Yes, sir, in the yellow shirt. I did not discuss the political situation with President Davis. Uh, I tried to avoid at all costs and hazards the discussion of politics. For sir, I am a military man and not a politician. I did and have and always will leave politics to the politicians and will do my best to be the best soldier I can be. As I mentioned earlier, had God granted the politicians cooler heads, we might not be here having this very conversation. Sir, back to the military situation, I have heard that there might already be Union artillery out of five forks. Uh, can you tell us about that? I've been hearing fire, fire from Five Forks all day here at my headquarters. Uh, and I'm quite anxious to hear the result. My last report was we had driven those people beyond Five Forks and established our lines there. But I have not heard word, and I'm most anxious to hear that word, that hopefully we have had a success and not another reverse. The, the newspaper editor's yeah. at work again. <laughs> yes, sir. General, just to go back to an earlier subject, had, uh, had Stonewall Jackson survived and been around to continue to lead and encourage his troops, do you think that the effect of his leadership and encouragement would have had an impact on the war effort in the South altogether? Sir, I do miss General Jackson so. I cannot speak to what may or may not have happened if General Jackson were with us. I cannot say. It distresses me to have lost such an able officer and good friend. Should I have directed events, I should have chosen for the good of the country to have been disabled in his stead. He lost his left arm and I my right. But I, I possess no crystal ball. I possess no means for venturing into the future of, with what may be or may not be. I am firmly grounded in the, in the earth and now, and that's where my creator would have me be. I will relate to you a uh, a most appealing and yet tragic story of General Jackson, if I may. Captain Power Smith of the General Staff, you may recall, had the occasion to relate to me, uh, as I said, a most appealing and yet tragic story of General Jackson. It was while we were head he was headquartered at Moss Neck in the winter of 62, He'd become quite taken with the young Janie Corbin, the six-year-old daughter of his host. He would take time from his busy schedule of military affairs to attend to the young girl every day. He would take tea with her and bounce her on his knee, so I'm told. Once on the occasion of our meeting, I inquired of General Jackson what had become of the braid on the very nice cap his lovely wife Anna had sent him. The general reclined and with his customary wry smile replied, why, your young Janie required better use of it for her hair. <laughs> it was after breaking camp at Moss Neck that Captain Kidd Douglas of the general staff brought him news the young Janie Corbin had succumbed to the scarlet fever. Captain Smith observed the general ride a few yards distant from his staff, bow his head, and wept convulsively at the news. 
I know not how to replace General Jackson. A more able officer and good friend I could not have had. Yes, ma'am. Excuse me? I'm not certain of Mr. Davis's feelings on that point. I never inquired uh, the exact direction of his feelings. Uh, he insisted that we must protect Richmond, and so we have done our level best as an army to do just that. Yes, sir. Never, sir. <laughs> His aunt's question was, would I entertain politics? When this conflict is over, and I pray it shall be soon, I think what I want most for the years that my God has granted me, should I survive, would you be fine, be able to find a small piece of earth where I can plant and feed my family and be amongst my family, who I've been estranged from far too long in my career as a military man. That should be my, my wish. But first, we must have the peace for that to be possible. Do you have a question, sir? I'm sorry. I thought you were waving at someone. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you, sir. Have you any sense that the end is uh, maybe near? I mentioned a letter I wrote to Mary from North Anna, and I did not mention the other part of my concerns about this General Grant. But I did suggest, I'm sorry to say, that I believe that if we were to be engaged completely in a siege, that it indeed may be all up with us. But I still hold a belief in this army that if I can steal a march on this General Grant, this army will do its job and it will do it well. Any other questions? 